It's actually falling from this fierce winter storm, of course, and also the corner wall and broad as the Dow crosses 25,000 for the first time. And yet not boo about what's happening, at least in stocks, at that White House briefing, just as we warned you would be the case when I was on Fox Business Network just a couple of hours ago. That was your homework assignment to see how many times it would come up, and it did not. Welcome, everybody. I'm Neil Cavuto to Fox Business Network's Deidre Bolton on that big milestone, yeah. whether it was talked about or not. Oh, exactly. Neil, huge day. We spoke earlier about this headline from Drudge on Twitter, Bull Beats Wolf. So a reference, of course, to the stock market bulls outshining some of the upset caused by journalist Michael Wolf and his book, Fire and Fury. So excerpts of the book have been released, have cast an unfavorable light on the Trump administration. Investors don't care. If you look at the markets, you have basically all stock buyers shrugging off this turmoil in D.C. The Dow up above 25,000 for the first time ever, marking that fastest 1,000 point gain in the average's history, more than 100 years. You'll remember last year as well, Neil, the Dow hit five 1,000 points point milestones, the most of its kind in its 120 year history. Plus, just worth remembering, we're in a nine year plus bull market. Tech stocks a big part of the momentum. So here are some of the biggest supporters of the market of these gains that we have seen. This is more than just today. So you do see Facebook slightly lower, but I'm talking overall in the past six months. You have Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Alphabet, Google, Apple and Microsoft all higher, most of them higher on the day, but most of them responsible for some of these huge gains. In addition to last year, of course, we saw the Nasdaq up at 16%. So all these gains are already on top of what we saw last year. So the big question is, where do we go from here? Market optimists say these lower corporate taxes are going to help a lot of companies, especially companies with tons of cash overseas, such as the tech giants. They're going to be able to repatriate a lot of the money that they have overseas, one time low tax rate, 15 and percent. And then in the future, they're not going to have to pay taxes on revenue that they earn overseas. So essentially, this puts American companies in line with most other industrialized nations in treatment of that overseas revenue. And yet we know this tomorrow. I mean, the job market is looking strong. We're looking for verification of that tomorrow morning. But economists that we've spoken with, they say payrolls probably grew by 190,000 last month with even fewer layoffs. So if you talk to the bulls, they're going to say nothing but green, nothing but more gains to come. Neil, in the meantime, back to you. And on and on they go. All right. Thank you very, very much, Peter Bolton. In the meantime, back to those hurricane forests, the winds that have been battering the East Coast and a very unusual type of a snowstorm that went all the way down to Florida. Wind gusts over 70 miles an hour expected in eastern Massachusetts, 50 miles hour plus winds in Long Island already. A lot of folks are without power, tens of thousands of them. Temperatures expected now to plunge and stay very low, single digits or worse in much of the country. To Brian Yenis now in Boston on how folks there are dealing with all of this. Brian. Hi, Neil. Well, right now we're talking about some 22,000 plus folks here in Massachusetts that are without power. Now, that's a big deal for a number of reasons. You mentioned those near hurricane force gusts and even hurricane force gusts that we're seeing out on the Cape, Nantucket, and on the islands of eastern Massachusetts. And that is a big deal because power outages with those heavy, with that heavy wet snow and that precipitation causes a lot of strain on those power, on those power lines. And then that causes people to have to be in their homes homes, perhaps without heat. So they're telling people that if you are without power, assess whether or not you can stay in your home and stay warm. If not, go to a friend's house or go to a warming shelter. Earlier today, we have been seeing record flooding here in Boston in terms of the tide. I want to say this is the, either going to be the highest tide Boston has ever seen, or it'll tie the highest tide ever set back in bl uh, the blizzard of 1978, some 15 feet is the tide, and we saw some flooding in Seaport, water going down into the Aquarium uh, T subway line there along the waterfront in downtown Boston. And it's not just water, it's that slushy water. And the big concern now is in all these areas along the water in eastern Massachusetts with that coastal flooding is the deep freeze that is expected when this storm rolls out of here tonight. If that water is taking a long time to recede because of all that ice and because of the temperature, it could cause problems where we're talking about not only hours, but days in which people can't get back to the
of their homes or in which that flooding persists. So again, right now, people need to heed the warning. Boston schools are closed tomorrow. Uh, good news, I guess, for some of those students. But again, stay off the roads. The plowing needs to be done uh, as this storm continues, Neil. Yeah, because none of this is going to be melting anytime soon. Brian, thank you very, very much. Brian Dennis. All right, let's go to our meteorologist, Adam Putz, on, uh, in the Fox News Weather Center. What we can be looking at now, um, you know, you educated me on this type of storm, what it does, but it's the fallout from it that, that, that we don't really understand, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we are still going to be dealing with this even as, after it moves across the, uh, the coast here in the next couple of days because it gets so cold. Here's where the storm continues to linger. There's your center of circulation running up the coast. Still some snow in New York City, but as it runs north into the east, it's getting closer to the coast. That's why spots like where Brian just was in Boston, seeing some of the worst of it, it'll be even worse if you run up into Maine, spots where you're going to still see more heavy snow and more strong winds. Heavy snow currently in Boston, in Providence, snow still falling off and on in New York City. It is lightning a little bit if you're further to the south in areas like Philadelphia, Atlantic City, but colder air is on the backside of this system. And no surprise here, we've been under a hurricane, or excuse me, uh, blizzard watches, warnings stretching up and down the entire coast. That continues for now as we track this moving to that northeastern uh, direction. What makes something a blizzard? Well, that's visibility and wind is a big part of it. You get a lot of wind whipping. It picks up that snow, makes it almost impossible to see. The visibility has been very low in Boston at times, down to a tenth of a mile, bumping up to a third of a mile. Winds anywhere from 30 to 40 miles an hour. Currently running into New York closer to half a mile of visibility. Wind still very strong. And wind still stronger on the backside of this system, even though the visibility is beginning to improve at this point. And now, as this continues to lift to the north, this is what you wanted to pay attention to. Look at how these numbers fall. All the air circulates around this, grabs some cold air from Canada, pumps it into the, it's the east. Uh, we're going to be looking at highs in the teens for tomorrow, Neil. So bundle up. Man, oh man. Adam, yeah. Thank you very, very yeah. much. In the meantime, this storm is also uh, wreaking havoc on uh, travelers, particularly flyers. More than 4,000 such flights canceled across the U.S. Another 2,000 flights suffering delays, and that's in the case of airports that are at least open. A good many are not. Let's uh, join Jeff Locke in the thick of it at Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Jeff. And we are just now, Neil, learning that international flights that cannot get into New York or Boston and Newark are now being diverted here to Chicago because that's the only place they can get in. They were in the air. So take a look at the boards out here. Uh, we just learned from American. We're in the American terminal here in Chicago, by the way, uh, at O'Hare. Boston, everything today canceled. The ones from Chicago to Chicago to Boston from Chicago canceled. Nationwide, anything from or to Boston canceled. Providence, Newark, LaGuardia, American, all canceled for the rest of the day today. JFK, a potential, maybe you'll get in there. Take a look at LaGuardia, pictures from inside the terminal. Today, you could just about run a track meet inside there. Nothing happening at LaGuardia. This uh, storm has been hitting there pretty much all day. We've got a map for you also that shows the misery and where it's worst. Uh, well, obviously in the Northeast, Boston, as we said, pretty much shut down. New York almost shut down. Newark as well. Uh, but as you look all over the country, there is misery everywhere because anybody trying to get to those cities obviously uh, is not going to get there as well. They're hopeful about tomorrow. But as you just heard, it's going to be awfully cold. Getting planes de-iced with all of that snow is going to be a real issue. Mess tomorrow, too. Neil. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you, my friend. Jeff Locke, Fox Business Network fame. Uh, in the meantime, how do you protect yourself in the event of this? Not just if you're a traveler or a flyer, but you're out there. Meteorologist Charlie Nace has some tips for you. He joins us now on the phone. Charlie, good to have you back. You know, the big, biggest thing people really forget is when it's really, really cold, how really, really vulnerable you are when you're outside. It big time, yeah. right? That, that's right, Neil. And with this storm, we also have added complication of lots of power outages. So you can have folks that are not out exposed to the elements, but they're in their homes, they lose power, and then you get a domino effect. You lose power, sometimes you lose heat, you lose heat, then all of a sudden you're facing frozen pipes. And now that the cold air is coming in, as the system begins to push off to the northeast a bit more, we're going to be dealing with these frigid temperatures right on through the rest of the weekend. So look out for those power outages. Make sure that you have lots of layers of clothing. It's better to wear layers of clothing rather than putting one thick layer on. Also, if you lose power, conserve the heat that you've got in the house that's existing. Close doors to each room. Put a blanket or maybe a towel at the bottom of the door. Seal that crack up to hold the heat in those rooms. Also, in case you're about to 
have your frozen pipes and you're going to lose your water stores, fill up a sink or maybe your bathtub with some hot water. That could provide a source of heat for a while. It could also provide you with a source of water if your pipes do freeze and your faucets quit working. And especially, do not use generators inside homes. That carbon monoxide poisoning is a is a big time threat. People have to use them outside in well ventilated areas. Wise words, all Charlie Meese. Thank you very much, meteorologist, uh, following all this development in Nashville, Tennessee. All right, uh, well, there was a White House briefing today, and on Fox Business, when we were talking about it, I, I, I kind of had like a school assignment for everybody: make sure, make sure um, you keep track of the questions that obviously concern the storm. Nothing really going on there. A certain book, everything going on there. Oh, yeah, and the Dow 25,000. Didn't happen after this. Did White House staff, including Steve, have to sign non-disclosure uh, agreements when they came to work at the White House? Let me just give a few examples of things that have been said in this book that are false. The president said today, I don't talk to Steve Bannon. I don't talk to him. Will the president go to court to stop the publication of this book? You saw that, right? You saw the White House briefing. Uh, I'm all for going into this book. Fascinating, great, great issues. But uh, we had another record on the Dow today. Uh, investors, that would include you, whether you know it or not, uh, directly or indirectly, you, you're up $7 trillion in market-related wealth since the election of Donald Trump. Whether you want to peg that to him or not, it, that's fair game. But it is a big story. Uh, no market on earth has been doing what our market has been doing here. And uh, not a single question on that. That's a little weird. Maybe uh, it's just because I'm, I'm not there. But Fox News Channel's Kevin Cork is from the White House. Kevin, that's remarkable. It really is, and it's frustrating, and I try to get to the heart of that. I know what that's like, Neil, when you have an agenda, obviously, as a spokesperson for the White House. You're trying to get your message out there. You're trying to communicate directly to the American people and share, listen, part of your agenda and what you are able to accomplish. You can't do that when all the talk is about some book uh, that they patently believe is full of falsehoods and outright lies. But here we were again, another day and another day wasted talking about a book. And I say wasted, at least from a policy perspective. I get the interest. I'm a journalist. People are going to be talking about it. But it's, sometimes it's frustrating if you want to get to the heart of what really matters to the American people. But there was news today for the first time. We heard the president talking about one of the people who is frequently quoted in the pages of that book, his former chief strategist, Steve Bannon. Now, as you know, the book has generated a storm of controversy because of a number of allegations, Neil, including a few eye openers from Bannon himself. Among the buttes from this guy, he said that Ivanka is dumb as a brick. He said that the president eats McDonald's because he fears being poisoned. And he said there was a one in three chance that the president would resign before the end of his term. Now, as for his part, Bannon seemed to play down uh, any rift that he might have with the president. He took to radio today and said, listen, I am still 100% behind the commander-in-chief. Don't worry, there will be no uh, daylight between the agenda, Donald Trump, and the uh, folks at Breitbart, and the, the show, and the websites. The President of the United States is a great man. You know I support him day in and day out, whether going through the country, given the Trump miracle speech, or on the show, or on the website. So I don't think you have to worry about that. But the patience of White House officials is, well, the ones who've had to field countless questions about the book. It's obviously getting just a bit threadbare. I'm less concerned with my exhaustion as I am with the people of this country who frankly probably could care less about a book full of lies and would really like to hear more about the booming economy, the crushing of ISIS, all of the great things that are happening in this country, or all of the big problems that we're focused on tackling. I don't think they really care about uh, some trash that uh, an author that no one had ever heard of until today. And yet this is part of the culture sometimes inside the Beltway, Neil. We have to react and respond to what's happening. And sometimes when the president weighs in on it, whether it's a statement or he comes out and makes a tweet about it, we have to follow where the news goes. And that can be frustrating both inside and, as you can well imagine, outside these walls. Back to you, my friend. Yeah, and just like you and I were saying, it's a legitimate story. I think the book is a legitimate story. The arguments they bring up, that's fine. The market's a legitimate story, too. I think we have time that's to exactly cover right. everything, you know. Yeah, I think you would think we could hit on that too, right? Yeah. That and the wall and immigration reform. Oh man, and oh man, we got time. Healthcare.
Do, yeah, well, you got some time? We could talk. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thank you very much. Stay warm. Kevin thank Cork you. at the White House. So that is basically my point here. When you have a record of the Dow, you don't have to exclusively be on it. But the way I figured, I think we had three news channels, right? We have a few business channels. They're all 24-7. That's a lot of time. Uh, so I, I had three hours a day here. It's pretty soon on the weekends. I had time to get into it all, like we're doing now. The Washington Free Beacons, Liz Harrington. Liz, what do you make of this, this fixation on this stuff not happening? Right. I, I think it's unsurprising if you watch the uh, White House press briefings every day. It's always a variation of the same question asked over and over and over again. I mean, today we had 19 questions asked about Steve Bannon and this book. Zero questions about the Dow, zero questions about uh, jobs being uh, the lowest layoffs since 1990. Uh, you have other things going on, like the administration opening up almost all offshore uh, waters to drilling. You have a new proposed regulation that's going to open up uh, free market options in health care. You have all these things happening, and yet no questions about it because the media is very shallow and they latch on to the most petty gossip story of the you day, know, and that's what they do. It's a very wise point, Liz, because my point is they don't even have to be fawning questions. If you're going to go on the market, you could say, why are you taking a bow for something that started under Barack Obama after the meltdown? Fair game. On the, the oil and drilling thing into the Pacific, you could ask a tough question, or you've given up on the environment, blah, blah, blah. Right. I'm just saying it's fair game to get into this other stuff, and I think we all in the media, your fine publication as well, have time to do that, and, but it's not happening. Exactly. And like you said, there's 24 hour news uh, networks and, and you and the good folks at uh, Fox Business tend to cover more of the actual news of the day. But if you flip around, it's it's either this petty new gossip that comes out or it's Russia, Russia, Russia. I mean, it's a year of this. They don't talk about anything else when, of course, you can be critical about anything the administration is doing. There's other news going on. And I think well you put. see with the tax cut. Uh, the effect on the market. There's a lot of positive things going on too, but he's never. Trump is never going to get a fair shake from the other news networks. Yeah, it is weird. Uh, Liz Harrington, thank you very much for watching the Free Beacon. And, thank you. Uh, and to Liz's point, I mean, take it from someone who's been called a never Trumper. This type of thing, this type of journalism, I'm telling you, whether you like the president or not, it's always wrong. You can cover everything. You can get into everything you want because we all, I'm telling you, folks, we have a lot of time. We really do. Meanwhile, temperatures are plunging and prices are spiking. Why this massive storm could hit you no matter where you live. Keep watching. All right. Uh, the president's legal team is already sending what they call a cease and desist to Michael Wolf. Now, he's the author. He's a pretty well-known guy, despite what uh, Sarah Sanders was saying. Uh, they offer a new book on the White House that is due out. Uh, he sent a similar letter to former chief uh, strategist Steve Bannon, who is widely quoted in this book. Now, the legal team is accusing Wolf and the publisher of malice. Do they have a case? Usually that's an uphill climb. By the way, Wolf has just tweeted a response to all of this. We're going to get to that in a second. But attorney Caroline uh, Balisi joins us right now. Caroline, normally public officials, especially all the way up to the president of the United States, have a very tough time making this case. What do you think? They, they do, actually. You're, you're absolutely right. There is that added element when you have a public figure of the actual malice element. But I'd like to make a distinction here. I think there is a case against Steve Bannon, not for defamation. This goes beyond your garden variety defamation case here. Remember, Steve Bannon had a written contract with Trump. Many Trump aides signed non-disclosure, non-disparagement agreements uh, with Trump or the organization. And that means that uh, his conduct is really governed by this agreement. So when you when you look at it from that perspective, you don't even get to an inquiry of whether or not the information that he gave was true or not, whether or not he had a malicious intent involved. The question is whether or not, and if you read uh, the letter that Charles Harder sent to Steve Bannon and his team, it makes perfectly clear that, uh, quote, confidential information was leaked with a capital C and a capital I, Neil. Now, you know what that means? That means that it's a defined term in the contract. So this is a contract case at its heart. When you get to the question of Michael Wolf, the publisher, that I think is a very much more difficult road to go down in terms of achieving a win on a defamation case. Uh, I also will just say that, you know, Charles Harder, this guy is the go-to guy when it comes to uh, defamation in, in the media realm. He's fresh off a win for Melania Trump. Remember, he got that multi-million dollar settlement against the Daily Mail. He got a retraction, oh, an apology. No you're, yes. you're, no, you're absolutely he, right about that. Yes. But you did mention Michael Wolf the other day. He is tweeting out,
here we go. You can buy it and read it tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. President. Obviously, there's reason to thank the president because he's just heightened interest in the book, right? Absolutely. Michael Wolff, in my opinion, faces no sort of legal liability here. In terms of, you know, there are First Amendment issues here at play. Um, the Steve Bannon issue, much, much different. I think Carter has a much... Why would that be different, Carolyn? Because we're, we're led to believe that Michael Wolff uh, often visited the White House, which was weird when I first heard it. So he would be seen there. And so he was obviously talking to people there. Oh, now, for oh, all absolutely. I know, he might have bumped into the president. But uh, it, it wasn't as if he was an unknown entity. Uh, and yet there he is walking to the White House talking to folks. Yeah, but, but Michael Wolff, again, did not sign a non-disclosure agreement with President Trump. He is not under any contractual agreement. He's, he's sort of a player in the open market here, so therefore the inquiry would so just be a defamation case. So they all agreements as they work, because we've had presidential tell-alls in the middle of an administration, the prior presidents. I mean, uh, what would make this case different? Yeah, so it's, it's not a, again, it's not a First Amendment inquiry. In, in the case of a civil suit, what would need to be shown was simply that the information that Bannon gave to Michael Wolff, knowing that it was going to be published, uh, comes under this subset of information that was qualified by this agreement. Now, we don't have the agreement. We haven't read all the ins and outs of, of what is covered in this agreement, but it seems pretty likely that there's a strong case here that he violated the terms of that non-disparagement agreement. We see agreements like this in employment all the time. It's not a defamation issue. I always issue. think they're not right worth the paper they're printed on. What, what do you say? Uh, you know, so in my estimation, Steve Bannon made a calculation here. He made a calculated move saying that, you know, the liability that he faced for the repercussions of him breaking this non-disclosure agreement, that is less than any amount of money he may be making uh, by gaining sort of the publicity around uh, this event. So, so I think he's making sort of a calculated legal analysis. I would be shaking in my boots if I were him right now from, from a legal perspective. He should be lawyering up. He should be looking at all the issues. Again, I don't think he faces a, a, a garden variety defamation claim. I think he faces a breach of contract claim. Wow. All right. It's very interesting. I didn't think of that angle. Caroline, thank you very, thank very you. much. Thank you. All right. You might have heard a thing or two about this record coal and uh, everything that's happening here. It's freezing. It's going to get even more freezing. You've heard about oil prices running up, gas prices running up, heat and oil running up. But, but, but the things you eat, they're running up, too, like oranges, other crops. Uh, uh, they're really running up faster, a lot faster. Food for thought after this. Remember Jeff Locke yesterday on the left in Chicago? Well, Phil Flynn is in almost the exact same place. The startling development here, two different coats. All right, we're so focused on this storm and the effect it has ahead of the fact, you know, a lot of people see, you know, heating oil prices run up and, you know, price of gasoline can run up and all, but a lot of other stuff runs up. And, and that could be a little bit more longer term in nature here. Phil Flynn in a very frigid Chicago and the financial hit from all of this. Phil, by the way, that is not the coat that I thought you'd be wearing. I thought you and Jeff Flock shared the same coat. Right. Both, but that's a very nice coat. So, right. touche. Thank you. Thank you got you. it. Jeff's is a cheap imitation. This <laughs> is a one of the choice of Eskimos uh, in Alaska. So Jeff's going to get one maybe next Christmas. Uh, but anyway, yeah, you're right, Neil. It isn't just about heating and oil. That's what we normally talk about. The, those prices are going up. They hit a two-year high. Natural gas prices, not as much. But in local markets where it's really cold, they are spiking. But it's about what we eat every year. I'm worried about this storm when it goes down south. You know, when we get uh, frost and snow in places like Florida, Alabama, all those warm states, that we could be in for a salad spike. That's right, Neil. Everything you put in a salad is coming into harvest in the south right now. We're talking lettuce. We're talking tomatoes. You know, we're talking broccoli. You know, all that stuff that's good for you, those prices are coming up. And it's coming at one of the worst times because this is the beginning of the year. Everybody is on a diet right now. They're all going to salads. Those prices are going up. So this could be an excuse to put off your diet because it is a, a weather emergency. So you can put it off till the prices start to come down. So that's what I'm recommending. But this, all kidding aside, is going to affect the U.S. economy to a small degree. You know, we're talking billions of dollars of a hit to the U.S. economy. The good news is, is that with the cold temperatures, we'll get a boost, of course, from, from people that are shoveling snow, people that have snow blowers, people that buy warm coats like this, and people that are very good about the market, uh, the traders can take opportunities. Like, I took an opportunity last year on the scarf 
I bought it end of season three dollars. Somebody offered me twenty-five dollars for this scarf just a few minutes ago. So that's opportunity. You can see that in weather conditions sometimes. Well, I know that's the way you roll, but I just want to make sure I've got this right, my friend. Uh, anything you put in a salad, including yeah. the lettuce, yes, sir. soaring. You said nothing about including processed lettuce. meats and cheeses. Any update on them? No, you know, actually, that could see prices go up because a what? lot of times with the farmers, when you get a lot of snow and cold, they can't bring the cattle to the market, so oh, those prices are going up as well. So I think you're just going to have to go to straight carbs for the next few weeks till these prices come down. All right, somehow we'll have to get through because uh, it's a great bakery that's around the block here. That's been hit by this. Game over, my friend. See? Uh, all right, thank you very, very much, <laughs> Phil. Have I got a deal for you, Flynn? Thank you. Uh, joining us out of Chicago. I'm going to talk to Flock tomorrow about this Navy, that he's wearing a cheap invitation. Meanwhile, a growing number of companies say they're going to use a lot of their tax savings to help out their workers. And a lot of workers said, yeah, yeah, I bet you are. Hey, workers, they are. A growing number of hits from this storm. American Airlines says that it's canceled already more than 1,300 flights, collectively more than 3,000 industry-wide. Now American is saying it's canceling uh, any flights uh, through the night that are headed into the New York metropolitan area. So if you are planning to head in there via American, it ain't happening. Uh, so for loved ones and all those wanting to know uh, where they're, where they're going to be, where loved ones are going to be to pick them up or go play, they're, they're not coming into New York. Not if they're on American. And, and normally, I, the way this goes is other airlines quickly follow suit. We'll keep you posted. Meanwhile, a number of companies are announcing that they're going to start giving workers bonuses, pay raises, maybe increase their own 401k get contributions to share some of the savings from that Republican tax cut bill. There are dozens of companies doing this right now. And uh, my buddy Charles Payne over at Making Money, the host of that fine show that kicks off in about an hour and a half on FBN, has been saying this is exactly how it would play out. A lot of people were suspicious of that. I guess they still are, Charles. They just don't see it happening. But, but it is happening, isn't it? You know, Neil, it's happening in so many different ways. I mean, the Trump tax plan obviously has produced what I'm saying is instant Main Street dividends. As each day, we see more and more companies are announcing windfalls for the employees, but also their communities and now charities. Dozens of the companies, of course, have announced these actions, all based on these new tax rates. And they also include, of course, let's not forget that window to bring home overseas profits. Now, I'm sure everybody's heard about these bonus checks, generally from 1000 to $2,000, but there are additional ways that America is benefiting. First of all, higher minimum wage. You know, there's mounting evidence that state-enforced wages, wage hikes like minimum wage hikes, actually produce job losses. But when you have companies that have the confidence to actually hike wages on their own, there's no employment disruption. Several companies, including BB&T, now starting their employees at $15 an hour instead of $12 an hour. And then there are retirement savings. Regents Financial increasing its 401k match for more than 22,000 employees. In addition, they're also offering them certain hospital and accident care products free of charge. What about infrastructure? Well, we know companies, when they invest on their own, they put the entire community to work. Think about this. Comcast announced that it's committed now to at least $50 billion over the next five years in additional infrastructure spending. Aflac is increasing its U.S. investments by $250 million. And one thing that's not getting enough ink, nil, charitable giving. U.S. Bank Corp. giving $150 million to charity as a result of the new tax laws. I counted five companies alone that have announced $355 million in charity, and I'm sure that number is going to climb significantly higher. You know, you always hear, Charles, too, people poo-pooing this, uh, especially on the left, and they'll always say, oh, the companies feel guilty or they got to do something. I don't care what their motivation is. I don't care whether the cynical view about AT&T and whether it went to curry favor with the White House by saying it's handing out bonuses. Who cares? They're doing it. My, my real question for you, though, is the impact this will have if you buy the established sort of rip on the tax cut that it disproportionately benefits corporations, which it does, but those corporations in turn do stuff like this because it does, then that could have, given the immediacy of all of this, a big impact, right? It should have a major impact. Think about this. Nancy Pelosi has argued for years that more welfare payments have what they call a multiplier effect. If you give out a dollar in welfare, you'll get a dollar fifty in spending. I argue that lower corporate taxes have a significantly higher multiplier impact on the community, not just wages, but also jobs and investments. So I'd rather see the money going there, creating opportunities for people to take care of themselves and for this nation, the same tide to lift all boats.
All right. Thank you very much, Charles Payne. It. Making money with Charles Payne. Best selling author as well. It's a great <laughs> show because he actually has to put the pedal to the metal. He actually has to make you money, and he does. Meanwhile, the congressional hopeful who is breaking with one Steve Bannon. It started with the president, now a guy who wants to be in Congress to help the president. Meet him next. All right. Well, first, the president said that Steve Bannon lost his mind. Now it appears that Mr. Bannon might be losing his friends, or at least those uh, with whom he had a sort of a political relationship, including my next guest. He is uh, the former New York Congressman Michael Grimm, running for uh, his old uh, House seat. Uh, we do have a call, by the way, into Congressman Dan Donovan's office. Uh, that has not been returned, but, you know, hope springs eternal. Anyway, it's very, very good to have you, Michael. Thanks for taking the time. It's great to be here, and I'll tell you, it was treacherous getting here, actually. No, I appreciate it, but you're a tough stock and a former uh, war veteran, so we appreciate that. But let me ask Absolutely. you a little bit, Michael, about, you know, you and, and, and Bannon, I, I wouldn't say we're really tight, but you were close, and he was very interested in, in your race. Now nothing. What happened? All right. Well, first, of all, we did only meet twice, but that, that's not the point. The point is, you know, I was working with Bannon's team for one purpose and one pers purpose only, and that was to help President Trump move his agenda forward. Period. End of story. And if I will not work with anyone that doesn't want to help our president and get that agenda where it needs to be, which is across the finish line, um, which will help not only the people of Staten Island and Brooklyn, but our entire country and, quite frankly, the world. He still seen that as bad and still seems to like the president's agenda. Uh, but he did say that he had, a, I think he said, a 33.3% chance, referring to the president or not, you know, not making it through the first term here, uh, that he might have to resign. What did you make of that? Well, I think the most disturbing part for me really was um, taking shots at the president's uh, children, his family. You know, that, that to me is just, it's, it's, it's appalling. Um, you shouldn't go there. And you know, I've said from the beginning that this Russiagate nonsense is a political witch hunt. To give it any credence whatsoever hurts the president and certainly hurts his administration. And it's a major distraction that the left has used to slow down the president's agenda and uh, to delegitimize his presidency. So anything that feeds into that is hurtful and harmful to the presidency. And I, and I simply can't support that at all. I mean, I'm diametrically opposed yeah. to this absolute political witch hunt, something I know, unfortunately, know quite a bit about. Now, it looks like Bannon has been sidelined after the Roy Moore loss. Remember, he was pushing for Roy Moore in Alabama, that kind of loss. Doug Jones, a Democrat, came in. Uh, now we're in the gap in the Senate of the 51-49 from 52-48. Do you think now that Bannon is finished? You know, I really don't know. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it, it, I won't allow it to distract from what I need to do. You know, I look at it as these were harmful comments, um, but not as harmful as my opponent, who has voted against the president's agenda every chance he got. And repealing Obamacare, he voted no. Um, sanctuary cities, banning that, voted no. And then he voted against the tax reform bill. So, you know, I, what I care about is what the people of Staten Island and Brooklyn. Well, wait a minute, well, you need can to argue why he would vote against the tax reform bill in your neck of the woods. Sure. In, in Staten Island, New York. I mean, a lot of people who can't write off their, their local state and sales tax. That, that's a big deal, right? Well, it's a big deal, but still over 90% of the people in my district will still have a tax cut. You know, that's the part that is very misleading. Will we have as much of a tax cut as someone, say, in Texas or in Florida that doesn't have any high state taxes? No, we won't have as much, but we will still have a tax cut. However, everyone's leaving out all the ancillary benefits that you just mentioned on your show. How about the fact that 401ks are going up? How about all the charitable contributions that are going on? the jobs that are being created. We can't forget all of this. You know, there's a lot of people in my district that are going to have all the ancillary benefits on top of a tax cut, although the tax cut is not as high, again, as those lower tax states. Right. But it's still very good for our economy, and over 90% of the people in my district will have a tax break. Do you worry, though, with what you're trying to do, Congressman, and get your old seat back, that maybe given what happened to Bannon, maybe given what happened to Bannon's uh, primary candidate in Alabama, Roy Moore, that renegade or, or rebel challenges, uh, I don't mean to trivialize you, uh, to, to, to established uh, Republican congressmen or women, uh, that, 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 that ship has is, is sailed. It, 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 no one wants to risk it. You say well, what? Well, Again, I think my race is very unique and very different. Let's, you know, the people in Staten Island and Brooklyn remember, number one, I'm the person 
um, that took on the entrenched Democrat that held the seat. I took it back for the Republican Party, not my opponent. He never would have done that. Michael, That's you're also the guy who had to serve time for something that maybe you argue you know, was an unfair rap, but, but they're going to remember you for that as well, right? Well, I think they're going to remember for all the work I did during, during Sandy recovery. I think they're going to remember all the bills that I passed and signed into law where my opponent hasn't even signed one substantive bill into law. And yes, of course, my opponent's going to make this all about the fact that I have, I have a, a criminal record now. But when we look at that, Loretta Lynch, the same person who's in the news now, that was a political witch hunt. I'm the only restaurant owner in the history of New York City not to be given a civil fine. And I think the people of Staten Island and Brooklyn are upset about that. I think they know that it was a political witch hunt and they know that I was targeted unfairly for, for the one reason, to get me out of office. And I was doing a very good job and I think the people of Staten Island and Brooklyn are going to believe in me again to do well, the do same exact job I was doing before. It's a congressional race, I grant you, it's a primary battle. I grant you, but do you think the president and, and do you want the president to campaign on your behalf? Oh, I would welcome the president to campaign on my behalf. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a 100 percent supporter of of uh, President Trump, but I don't think that he would get involved in a primary like this. I, I don't think it behooves him to get involved in contentious primaries. Uh, you don't as the think president you're dividing the, the Republican field and let's say uh, you or Donovan were to win um, and Dan Donovan.